We're talking about the scenario that will happen when the earth lease expires. Now somebody said, Brother Caps, you're fantasizing. Well, it's scriptural fantasy. I'm seeing some things in my spirit I can't even get out of my mouth yet. But we're about to see the manifestation of God's power on this planet like no other generation has seen. And it's going to come when the earth lease expired. It's even bleeding into it now. If you read Isaiah, the 30th chapter, verse 26, he says, The light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. Now go back to what we taught in one of the other sessions. That the fourth day of the Genesis account, the greater light ruled the day, represents the sun of righteousness coming to the earth. The lesser light ruled the night, which is the moon, which has no light of itself, but reflects the light of the sun. That's the born again believers that reflect the light of Christ to a sin darkened world and rule the darkness of this planet. They keep the Antichrist spirit from taking over until the church is taken out. Now listen to Paul in Ephesians 4. He said, A fivefold ministry for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. What is the perfect man? The church. He calls it a perfect man. Unto the fullness. He's not through. Unto the fullness of the stature of Christ himself. Now, if we come to the fullness of the stature of Christ himself at the end of the six days of human history, and the light of the moon is as the light of the sun, and the sun represents the sun of righteousness... So God has just turned the power up till we minister as Jesus ministered. The light of the moon becomes as the light of the sun. It's exactly what Ephesians 4 says. Till we come to the unity of faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, to the fullness of the stature of Christ himself. Now somebody said, Brother Caps, you don't really believe that we're going to do greater works than Jesus did. No, I don't just believe that. I know it. (laughs) Jesus himself said we would. We didn't understand it. And I didn't hardly see how it could happen until recently. Till this revelation began to come forth. How could it happen? In 6,000 years of human history, no man has ever ministered on planet earth when the wicked could not hinder the work of God. In Jesus' day, every place he preached, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were there. The Sadducees, they were always at him, trying to get something. You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in the angels or spirits or the resurrection. That's the reason they were sad, you see. (laughs) Pharisees believed in both. That's the reason they were fair, you see, but... little humor there. Somebody said very little. (laughs) But in 6,000 years of human history, no man has ever ministered, not even Jesus has ministered on planet earth when there was no resistance or no one could hinder the gospel from going forth. Well, somebody said, how in the world could that happen? I'm glad you asked that. Turn with me to Matthew 13, chapter. Let's get it out of Jesus' mouth. I mean, when you get in trouble, read the red. The parable of the tares. Now, I'm going to abbreviate it for the sake of time. The parable of the tares reveals this, that a fellow sowed his field, and his servant come and said, didn't you sow good seed in this field? He said, whence cometh these tares? He said, an enemy has done this. He said, you want me to go out and gather them up and pull them up? No, no. Verse 29. But he said, nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until harvest. Let them both grow together until harvest. Folks, we're coming to the harvest season. Let them grow together until harvest, and in time of harvest, I will say to the reapers. Now, as you read further over here, this is a double parable. 
In the first part of it, Jesus reveals a progressive thing. The second part of it, when he tells it again, he changes it somewhat. It's a progressive parable. Now watch what he says. I will say to the reapers, gather first the tares. Now the reapers are angels. We find this out over here in the next part of it. The reapers are angels. He'll say to the angels, gather together first the tares. What's that? We find in the latter part of it that he says it's the wicked plants in the earth by Satan. Wicked plants. The wicked that he's planted in the earth. He said, gather together the tares, bind them in bundles, not and burn them, to burn them. They're not going to be burned at that time. They're not going to be burned at that time. They're just going to be bound where they can't pollute the harvest. They're going to be bound in bundles. Now what's happened? The earth lease has expired and man loses his authority. Wicked men has no more authority on earth. All the people on earth that have authority is those connected with Jesus. So the angels bind the wicked to where evil spirits and demonic forces cannot use their authority anymore because they don't have any. They lost it. But we didn't lose ours. We get ours from the head of the church. We're considered with Jesus. And what God took back over, then we're one with Him. So wicked men lost their authority. Demons and evil spirits lose their ability to hinder the gospel or pollute the harvest. Are you ready for this? Bind them in bundles to burn them. In other words, be burned at a different time. Not at that time. But gather the wheat into my barn. Here's the great harvest of the earth. This is a harvest. This is the wholesale reaping of the righteous of the earth. There's going to be a revival that hits planet earth like no revival in all of 6,000 years of human history. When the lease expires, the wicked are bound spiritually to where the wicked cannot hinder the gospel. And we will have authority. Now here's a scenario that can take place. See, there's two things involved in gathering the wheat into his barn. First, gather all the wheat that you can get. And then the rapture of the church takes it out. But there's coming a great ingathering. See, that's what happens at harvest. A great ingathering. A great ingathering. And then gather it into his barn. That's talking about the new Jerusalem. The Lord's house. The house of the Lord. We'll get into that. And show you scriptural composite that reveals when the house of the Lord is finished and ready for us. He's revealing it to this generation. So here you have a harvest that's about to take place. The wicked are bound in bundles. Now that doesn't mean they're physically tied up. That means they lose their authority. Now here's a scenario. God may say to Brother Sims. Go tell the Supreme Court, thus saith the Lord. You do remember in the early church, what we call the early church, Ananias and Sapphira deal? They said one of the greatest offerings that were ever taken was when Peter and John came back from burying Ananias and Sapphira, (laughs) stood on their shovel handles at the back of the church, said, has everybody paid their dues? Boy, that'll get your attention. God may say to Brother Sam, or Brother Copeland, go tell the Supreme Court, thus saith the law. Change the abortion ruling and do it today. Stop killing a million unborn children. They're not fetuses, they are children. They're souls. And they'll say, we're not going to do it. Okay, we'll read your obituary in the paper in the morning. And when their obituary shows up in the paper in the morning, and folks hear about it, that a prophet of God said to the Supreme Court, if you don't change the ruling, your obituary will be in the morning paper, and it was in the morning paper, they will court our favor. They'll be coming to the church and saying, what else do you want us to change? 
We're with you. We believe God is on your side. We're with you. They'll court our favor. Somebody said, are you sure about that? Well, go back and see the composite in the Word of God. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. When Israel came out of Egypt, they had favor. They gave them silver. They gave them gold. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Yeah, we were with you, we were with you. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen in the same profile. They're going to be ready to get rid of us by the time we leave. Because they're going to be folks dying like flies that are trying to resist the work of God. In that time frame, when the lease expires, if they raise one finger against the work of God, they will be terminated probably almost instantly. God is fed up with the wicked running the earth. Jesus, the King, is coming. Blessed be God. Mm, mm, mm. I don't know whether I've helped you or not, but I talked myself happy. Well, somebody said, Brother Caps, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Well, just hide and watch. It may not happen exactly like that, but that's a scenario that could happen when the lease expires. Folks, there is no clearer composite in the Word of God than the 6,000-year lease, the time frame that God has given man to subdue the earth. He will not have 6,001 years. He will have 6,000 years. And then that earth lease expires, and once it expires, wicked men lose their authority. But all that are born again still have authority under the head of the church and God. And there is going to be a revival like no one has ever seen. Now, we noticed in the scripture that in the morning of the third day, Exodus, the 19th chapter, the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, there says, Rapture. Skip ever of the letter in the 16th verse, starting with the third letter, spells rapture. Okay, the Hebrew day begins in the afternoon at sundown. There would be 12 hours till sunrise. That would be considered morning. If we're reading that composite right, that could reveal there is six months period of time. What does Romans, the ninth chapter, say? Paul said, God will make a short work of righteousness, cut it short in righteousness. Have you noticed it's not God's style to go out in defeat? The church is not going out a bedraggled, sickly, in debt church. We're going out with all that we need to preach the gospel to this end time generation, and it's already started. The flow of finances has already started in the church. Jesus, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, reveals that the Good Samaritan gave the host, which represents the Holy Ghost that's taking care of the church, gave him two days' wages, representing the two days of the church age, but said, Whatsoever thou spendest more. In other words, whatever it takes... Whatever finances it takes to see that the church comes to full maturity, to the full stature of Christ himself, at the end of this church age, see to it that they get it. Make a demand on the promise. And it's going to be available for this end time harvest. Like no other harvest in all of human history, God is going to minister to the earth. Now we're here in Exodus, the 19th chapter. Let's dig around a little further in this. I said to the fellow that had searched the Torah code and the computer program with the Torah code, actually came to my office, and he spent a couple days there. And I said, search this chapter here in Exodus 19 for anything that has to do with Michael and the church and heaven. Are you ready for this? Fasten your seatbelts. Here's what we found in a skip sequence. Now, this is a, what they call an ELS sequence. Not necessarily a scientific code, but it does not mean that it's not important because it's important where you find this. 
If you found it somewhere else over here, you know, in the book of Esther, you'd think, well, maybe it means something, maybe it doesn't. But to find it in this chapter, where that it came to pass the third day in the morning, and we find the Hebrew word for rapture right there in the original Torah, here's what he found. In a skip sequence, ELS, that's where he skipped ever so many letters, he found Michael, he took church into heaven. In this chapter right here. Now, see, if that violated the word of God, you know, and, and that wasn't what the word taught, then we'd say, oh, well, you know, and we would discount that. But how can you discount that when you find it here where he said the third day in the morning, rapture? Now, see, there's people, you know people that say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. That won't hold water now. There's some other things that won't necessarily hold water. You've heard people say, well, no man knows the day or the hour. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. That's exactly what Jesus said. If I were to say to you, no one knows when the Cowboys will play in the Super Bowl again. That'd be true, wouldn't it? Absolute truth. Nobody knows. But what if they won the playoff this fall? And they've already set the date for the Super Bowl. And I get up and say, nobody knows when the Cowboys will play in the Super Bowl. They say, boy, you need your head examined. Had you seen the sports cast? They're going to play in January. No, nobody knows. Well, nobody knew back then. But you see how time changes things? Now, Jesus himself said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Not talking to his generation. However, he said, when the spirit of truth is come, he'll teach you all things. He'll guide you into all truths. He'll take a mind and he'll show it to you. And he will show you things to come. Now, couldn't that be the part that would reveal that he will show to this generation the day and the hour? I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it could be. You understand what I'm saying? See, we found precedent in the Word of God that it is possible. Since you find precedent that they knew the exact day Elijah's going. And Jesus knew the exact day he's going. And I believe that Enoch knew the day he was going. So you have pretty good precedent that every time there's a rapture, they knew when they were going to the exact day. At least two of them did. We're not sure about Enoch. I haven't found anything that proves that he knew the exact day, but it's possibly he did. That could be an implication, a prophetic implication, that God will reveal to the church the exact day. Why would he do that? Well, why wouldn't he do it? See, we've all heard these kind of stories. Well, there'll be train crashes, plane crashes, automobile crashes. going to be havoc and millions of people will be killed because of the rapture of the church. I don't believe God's going to kill a multitude of people just because we leave planet Earth. It could happen. But I believe this scenario. I believe that God will reveal to the church the day we're going. May not reveal it two days. He may just reveal it to our spirit. may not be preached from the pulpit. But we'll just know that we know that we know we know and don't know how we know. We just know. And then you see, if I'm flying an airplane and scheduled to carry a couple of unbelievers somewhere, (laughs) I'll say, you know, uh, I think we'll put off that flight for a few days. Because, you see, it's going to be like the guy was one time that said to me, he was flying with me, he started looking around, acting scared. He said, hey, hey, hey. I said, what is it? He said, well, what if you was to have a heart attack? You fly in this airplane, you was to have a heart attack. I said, don't worry about it. You'd probably have one too. <laughs> he said, yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> well... You know, one fellow said to the guy trying to get him to go with him, said, don't you know that when it's going to be your time, you're going to go anyway? Well, that's not really true, but most people believe that, you know. 
And he said, yeah, but suppose we get up there and it comes your time to go. Wouldn't I be in a mess? <laughs> but you see, I believe that God, the reason that God would reveal, possibly reveal to the church the day we're going, is so that we won't kill a lot of people when we leave this planet. See, God's merciful. God wants those people saved. Not God's will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And if they get killed just because we left, you know, I just don't believe that's God's style. So it could be that all of the airline pilots that are born again would say to their co-pilot, hey, you fly left seat today, I'm just going to ride and just kind of observe things. <laughs> well, why do you want me to do it? Well, there's going to be some special event happening today. And they fly along there, and after a while, he looks over, and he's gone. So you still got a pilot there today, and not a lot of people get killed. That's my idea of it. I, I don't think God's going to take a lot of, what I'd say, innocent people. And then I don't know that the wicked are innocent, but it's just not God's style to do that. But what God is revealing to this generation, you see, other generations have sought desperately to know. The good news is the king is coming. And he's coming very soon. God is about to change things on planet earth. In 6,000 years of human history, there has never been a time like this in all of human history. We are the most blessed generation that has ever lived on planet earth. And God is going to show out in the end of this era of time. Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. What's that mean? He began the church age. He was the first one born, first born among many brethren. He began the church age. And Jesus will end the church age with the rapture of the church. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. Let me just share with you some of the things, just briefly. We'll, we'll talk about this some more. But since I mentioned the Bible code, let me just do this. How do we know that there is a code in the Bible, in the Torah? Because we can go back and see almost every major headline in history in it, encoded over 3,000 years ago. Look at this. Economic collapse, the Depression, 1929, stocks. Here it is in a skip sequence in the Torah what happened, wasn't it? To shut up the words and seal the book until the end. There it is right in the plain text in the Torah. Yasak Rabin, name of assassin who will assassinate Amir. Name of assassin. Encoded in the Torah over 3,000 years ago. Kob Japan. Fire, earthquake, big one. Ancient year, 5755, that's the Hebrew calendar, 1995. It's exactly when it happened. Here's one. Shoemaker-Levy, that's the comet, will pound Jupiter, 8th of all, July 16th, 1994. Exact date that it struck Jupiter. Exact date. Here's one for you that'll get your attention. Morning of the 19th, Oklahoma City, he pounced, he brought terror, dead bodies, torn to pieces, Murrah building. His name is Timothy McVeigh. Encoded in the Torah over 3,000 years ago. Now, was it encoded there because it was God's will? No. For knowledge, to reveal to this generation that this Bible is the Word of God. Pretty good track record, hasn't it? Almost any major headline in past history is encoded in the Torah. In fact, the rabbis believe that every person that ever lived on planet Earth, everything they ever did, is encoded in the scriptures. And it is probably the book that will be opened at the judgment. 
Now, you have people that say, well, I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. See, in days past, we just had to say, well, you know, the prophetic word has been fulfilled, so you'd have to consider it, at least. But you can't convince an atheist of that. But when they can look in the Bible computer program of the Torah and find headlines, major headlines of past history to the exact date, Wright Brothers Airplane gives the place that they invented the airplane. Edison Light Bulb. Somebody said, why, you could take a phone book and come up with that if you just went through it, you know, and searched all it. No, they've tried that. They can get a few names, but no details. The Bible is the only place that gives you details of past events in human history. So if you have someone, they say, well, I don't believe the Bible's the Word of God, get them the Bible code. You can get it in almost any major bookstore written by Michael Drosnan. He's an atheist. Isn't that just like God to use an atheist? (laughs) He said, we know that whoever encoded the Scriptures knew the future but it seemed like he didn't have the ability to change it because some places he'd say, will you change this? See, there's certain things that can be changed if you make the right decision concerning Israel. But see, he didn't understand the earth lease. God can't change it unless man changes it until the lease expires. And he said, now, I'm not a man of faith and I don't even believe there's a God. And he said, if there was a God, he could change it. But see, he didn't have enough information to make a decision on that. Well, I wrote him and sent him my book said, if you contact me, I'm not a flake now, but I can answer your questions that you have. But you see, if you have someone said, we don't believe the Bible is the word of God. I had a lady tell me that her father, he, he wasn't on church at all, you know, but he got a hold of my book. And then he got a hold of the Bible code book. And he went back to the church. The church had them in their bookstore, and he bought three more and started giving them to his friend. Now, this is an unbeliever. It'll get the attention of the unbelieving world, folks. Now, God will use anybody. See, now, if a Christian had written this book, why, the world turned thumbs down on it immediately. But since an atheist wrote it, the theologians turned thumbs down on it. Theologians are almost always wrong. But you see, they had said, oh, that's them Christians trying to prove something. But their own wrote the book. And he said, I report only facts. So if you know somebody that doesn't believe it and not born again, if you get them the Bible code and end time events, I believe they'll be born again. The good news, Jesus is coming. Amen. Bad news, a lot of folks not ready. Somebody said, Brother Caps, how long is it do you think we have? I really don't know. I really don't know for sure. It's close. We're talking about the prophetic timeline that reveals end time events in a general time frame and in some pretty complete detail through the scripture. Now, let me just take just a few minutes and review some of the things that we've found, and then we'll launch from there. We have found in the scriptures that in the Genesis account, the six days of the Genesis account, a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, thousand years is a day, Peter said. That applies to the Genesis account. Now, there were 24-hour days, but it represents 6,000 years of human history. And after that, there's a major change. And then there's a seventh day of rest, which is the seventh millennium. So we have six days... There in Genesis, it represents 6,000 years. Now, we talked about the three keys. Just briefly, let me run over those three keys. I'll help you understand end time events. One is Isaiah 46, 10. God spoke the end from the beginning. Genesis is the beginning. He laid out the blueprint in Genesis. And then in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, thousand years is a day. Then we found that in Ecclesiastes 1, what I call the Solomon concept, that the thing that hath been 
is that which shall be. The thing that's done in past is that which shall be done in the future. And the thing that happens in one time frame happens again in another time frame. And we call this law of double reference in the scriptures. There is a present day fulfillment in the Bible days, but there is another fulfillment in prophetic scriptures and so on. On the day of Pentecost is a perfect example of that. Peter stood up and said, This is that which was spoken of Joel. It has come to pass in the last days. God pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Well, it did happen then, didn't it? But there is another prophetic fulfillment of that for the Jews, probably during the tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ. There will be the complete fulfillment of that. So, double reference. Then we found in Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse 3, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man, yet his days shall be 120 years. Obviously, he's not talking about normal years. He's talking about jubilee years. He's talking about days of man's dominion will be 120 jubilees. God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea fowl there for how long? Evidently for 120 jubilees. Then we found that Moses lived exactly 120 years. And he represented the righteous dead of all the 120 jubilees. Now one of the things we left out in one of the other sessions was the fact that Paul makes this statement in Romans that death reigned from Adam to Moses over those that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Now, what does he mean, death reigned from Adam to Moses? It looks to me like death is still reigning. You ever heard of anybody didn't die because there wasn't enough death to go around? But what's he talking about? Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Well, you see, when Moses died, that represented the righteous dead of the 120 jubilee years. And Paul picked up on that. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. When Moses died, Joshua took over. And Joshua crossed that Jordan, which is a type of spiritual and physical death. And Joshua was a type of Jesus. In fact, it's the name for Jesus, the Hebrew name for Jesus. So he represents Jesus. And when they crossed that Jordan, that Jordan dried up from there to the Dead Sea. Get it? The Dead Sea? And it stood up in a heap and flooded its banks from there all the way to the city of Adam. So death reigned from Adam till when Moses died, and that represented all the death they will be on planet earth before the rapture of the church. Because Moses represents the righteous dead of the 120 jubilee years. So we found out then that in Matthew the 16th and 17th chapter, that Jesus said, some of you standing here won't taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And after six days He taketh Peter, James, and John up to high mountain apart, was transfigured before them, His face did shine as sun, His raiment was white as light. There appeared Moses and Elijah talking with Him. This is an exact composite of the rapture of the church after six days, six 1,000-year days of human history. How far after, we're not exactly sure. Doesn't mean it'll happen exactly when the 6,000 years is up. There seems to be possibly a space of time up to six months there before the rapture of the church. And then after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist will be revealed. So we know then that Moses and Elijah appeared on that mountain. That's the reason they appeared there, because they represent the righteous dead and those caught up alive and did not die. Elijah did not die. He was caught up alive. And so we followed that prophetic time frame and found that it's connected with the number 120, 120 jubilees. Now, we're going to talk about biblical numerics. We're not talking about numerology. There's a great difference, a vast difference. We're talking about the way God uses numbers in the Scriptures to confirm revelation of the Word. You cannot build doctrine on numbers, but the way numbers are used in association with events in the Bible confirm the revelation of the Word. And we will see that as we go along. Now, we're going to talk about the house of the Lord. 
Turn there, if you would, to John, the 14th chapter. Now, how many of you realize Jesus was a prophet? Listen to what Jesus says here in the 14th chapter of John. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. Now, where is he going to prepare this place? In the Father's house, isn't he? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, where? In the Father's house. There ye may be also. Where? In the Father's house. Now where is the Father's house? It's the New Jerusalem. That's the house he's preparing. Now folks, do you realize he's been working on this place for 2,000 years? How would you like to know when it's going to be finished? The scriptures reveal when it's going to be finished. We're going to find out. Just stay with us. So here he says, I go and prepare a place for you in the Father's house. And I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Now there's people teaching that there is no rapture. That God's not going to remove the righteous from the earth, but he's going to remove the wicked. Well, God is going to remove the wicked from the earth, but he's going to remove the righteous first. Then we're going to heaven with him come back after seven years, and we're going to remove a major part of the wickedness from the earth. And the end of the seventh millennium, all wickedness will be eliminated from planet earth. This is revealed in the account of Joshua. When Joshua marched around Jericho, Jericho is a type of the wicked world. He marched around it one time a day for six days, representing 6,000 years of human history. Seven priests were blowing seven trumpets, a type of a prophetic warning to the wicked world for six days of human history, and then there is a major change. And... It has been preached from pulpits. It has been preached on radio and television in all kinds of ways for 6,000 years that this thing is coming to a close. And everybody thinks, oh, it's just millennium fever. It happens every millennium. All the millennial nuts come out and start prophesying doom and gloom. Well, I'm not a millennial nut, and I'm not prophesying doom and gloom. I'm prophesying the glorious church is about to rise to its feet and finish the work on planet earth. And we will go to be in the Father's house. I'll tell you what, I'm excited about the Word of God. Now, we see this in the Word of God. There is a composite in the Word of God that reveals when the Father's house will be finished. Now, how many of you realize that Jesus was a prophet? Sometimes we forget that. We know He was a preacher and a teacher, but we forget he was a prophet. He was prophesying. Just what I read was prophecy. He prophesied he's going away and he's preparing a place for us in the Father's house and then he's going to come again and receive us unto himself that where he is, where in his Father's house, he's seated there at the right hand of his Father. He's going to come and receive us unto himself. Now, at that time, you can tell from that scripture, it does not say he's coming to the earth and set up his kingdom. It's not time yet. But he's going to catch away the church. Well, we can get into the Old Testament and find the Old Testament types, foreshadowing and composite, scriptural pictorials, if you will, that reveals when the house of the Lord is finished and ready for the church. And I'll tell you what. It is exciting news and it's not doom and gloom when you begin to see that God is revealing to this generation what no other generation on planet earth has understood concerning the house of the Lord and when it will be finished and it is absolutely laid out methodically and numerically in the scriptures where anybody can understand it. Are you ready for this? Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Second Chronicles. We're talking about when the house of the Lord will be finished for the church, for the body of Christ. Jesus stated, in my father's house are many abodes. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Second Chronicles chapter 3, 
Let's watch this prophetic profile unfold, revealing when the house of the Lord will be finished. Verse 1, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem and Mount Moriah. Now look at verse 3. Now these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. The length by cubits after the first measure was three score cubits and the breadth was twenty cubits. And the porch in front of the house, the length of it was according to the breadth of the house, twenty cubits, and the height was 120 cubits. Now let's notice first of all that the three score cubits is the length, and the breadth was 20 cubits. Now let's add those cubits together because this gives us some insight. We add those cubits together, and you got 60 cubits and 20 cubits. That's 80 cubits, right? And then the porch in front of the house, which is the approach to the house of the Lord, is 20 cubits by 20 cubits. Add those cubits together, and you have 40 cubits. So 40 cubits and 80 cubits are 120 cubits. Is that a familiar number? Man's days shall be 120 years, 120 jubilees. These cubits represent jubilee years, and it lays out the plan when the house of the Lord will be finished at the end of the 120th jubilee. Now, the height of the porch was what? 120 cubits. God said, I'm going to say it so many ways you're going to get it, one way or the other. Now come to verse 8. And he made the most holy house, the length whereof is according to the breadth of the house, 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 20 cubits, and he overlaid it with fine gold, amounting to 600 talents. Now this most holy house is what they call the holiest of holies. It was 20 cubits by 20 cubits. Now notice it sets inside these other dimensions that we've just read. The overall dimensions of the house of the Lord is 120 cubits. But this 20 by 20 cubits sets inside the 120 cubits. Now, if we're talking about 120 jubilee years, 6,000 years of human history, and then we're talking about the church age, the most holy house represents the church age, which is 40 jubilees. 40 times 50 is what? 2,000. Now, interesting thing, if you go back and multiply these cubits together, see, we added them. And somebody said, well, you multiply it to find square footage or square cubits. So let's do that. If we multiply 60 cubits by 20 cubits, you get 1,200 cubits. And the porch is 20 by 20, that's 400 cubits. And then the most holy house here is 20 by 20 cubits. And you add them all together and you got 2,000 cubits. Isn't that interesting? And the year 2000 seems to be the end of the church age. At least the church age is 2,000 years long. Now the most holy house, all that was in this most holy house was the word of God in stone that God gave to Moses. That's all that was in it at this point. Now they put some other things in there later. But that was all that was in here was the word of God. Now, where would you expect to find the Word of God today? In the church, wouldn't you? It represents the church age. And it's 20 by 20 cubits. Those cubits represent jubilee years. The church age is 40 jubilees. In other words, it is a generation of jubilees. A generation, 40 years. A jubilee is 50. 50 times 40 is 2,000. That's the length of the church age. We've already found, and we'll not take time to go back, there's no less than nine prophetic composites in the Word of God revealing the church age is two days, two 1,000-year days long. And uh, Hosea said, for instance, in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, he said, God has torn and he will heal us. Talking about Israel. God has torn and he will heal us. After two days he will revive us. You see, God quit dealing with Israel when they crucified Christ, turned his time clock off, left one week of years to deal with Israel. One seven-year period. It's called Daniel's 70th week. It's called Jacob's trouble. It's called the tribulation period. And God will, after the church age, turn again and begin to deal with Israel and the wicked world to force them to make a decision either for God or against Him. 
He will put the pressure on the world then. Why would he put pressure on the church? We've already made the decision. But you see, the church age is represented here, and it fits inside this 120 cubits. The church age of 2,000 years fits inside the 120 jubilees. Now, they overlaid it with 600 talents of gold. Now, this is an interesting number. This number will follow God's people in one way or another all through the scriptures, almost totally, not, you can't say always, but more often than not. It's connected in one way or another with God's people. For instance, here's where it starts. Here's where you find the first connection. Noah was 600 years old when he entered into the ark. Now, Noah is a type of the righteous being caught out before judgment came and is a prophetic profile of the rapture of the righteous before judgment comes on this wicked world. And he was 600 years old when he entered into the ark. Now, that is important that we notice that because we see other 600s in the scriptures. Now, let's just dig around in that number a little bit. When Israel came out of Egypt, God's people came out of Egypt, how many thousand were they? Men. 600,000 men, plus the women and children. So there were 600,000 of God's people. How many chariots did Pharaoh, after he changed his mind, send after them? 600. This number 600 is almost always connected in one way or another, either against God's people or associated with God's people. And then we get over into the uh, 1 Samuel 17. You remember they sent David out there to see how the battle was going with his brothers? You know, his brothers were in the army. They went out there to see how the battle's going. There's not any battle going on. They're all watching television. Yeah, they're out there watching that giant come out and tell his vision every morning for 40 days. How many days did he tell his vision? 40 days representing the devil, the spirit of the devil, or the wicked that will taunt the church for 40 jubilee years, and it's all over after 40 jubilees. What happened after 40 days of that giant Telling his vision, David showed up and said, I'm going to tell my vision. I'll take your head off your shoulders. I'll feed your carcass to the fowls of the air. He said five times what he's going to do before he did it. Then he ran out there in the brook and gathered up five smooth stones. How did those stones get smooth? You know what they represented? The fivefold ministry. They got smooth by the washing of the water of the word. And he took one of those stones, put it in his sling, and he slung that rock, and the giant rolled. Someone said he's the first rock and roll artist. (laughs) So after 40 days, it was all over. Sent his saddle home, John. He's done. (laughs) Representing 40 jubilee years that the wicked and the devil will taunt the church, and after 40 jubilees, they will taunt it no more. Prophetic profile. Now, did you notice that that giant had a spearhead that weighed 600 shekels of iron? What was he going to do with it? He was going to use it on God's people, he thought, but he didn't. Then we find over in Chronicles that Solomon built some shields and put 600 shekels of gold in each shield. What's it going to do? Stop the 600 shekels of iron. See, connected with God's people in one way or the other all through the Bible. Now you'll see that Saul, when he took over a certain city and was supposed to destroy all the animals, he didn't, you know. And the Spirit of God left him. He had 600 men with him when he did that. Now that was God's people and he was anointed at that time. Now the anointing God left him and went upon David and the next chapter or two you see 600 men with David. See, the 600 follows God's people. And you will see this prophetic number associated with God's people many times through the scriptures. And it follows it from Genesis to Revelation. And it reveals 
a timeline and a story as we'll see as we go along. But it's exciting to know that God has revealed in his word and used biblical numerics to confirm the timeline and what is about to happen to the church age in this generation. Here in Second Chronicles, we get a prophetic overview of when the house of the Lord is finished. Come to the fifth chapter now, and let's notice the house of the Lord is finished. Let's read verse 1. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. Now let's look at how they celebrated the house of the Lord being finished. Come over to verse 11. It came to pass that when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. And also the Levites, which were the singers, and their sons and their brethren, arrayed in white linen, having cymbals, psalteries, and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests. How many priests? A hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets. They are celebrating the house of the Lord is finished. Now here's your clue when the house of the Lord is finished. There's 120 priests blowing 120 trumpets. Now go back to Leviticus just mentally. Let me take you to Leviticus 25. It said, after 49 years, seven Sabbaths of years, the priest will blow the shofar, the ram's horn, and declare the year of jubilee. Every 50th year is a year of jubilee. One priest blows one trumpet and declares jubilee. So if you have 120 priests blowing 120 trumpets, it's obviously the 120th jubilee when the house of the Lord's finished. Prophetic profile beyond any doubt as far as I'm concerned reveals when the house of the Lord is finished and ready for the church at the end of the 120th jubilee. Somebody said, Brother Caps, you're setting times. No, I'm just showing you the time God has set. I'm not bashful about it. God's already set the time. He's laid it out here to where you can see it. It's ready at the 120th Jubilee. Now, will we be caught up to that house exactly at that time slot? Maybe so, maybe not. But it can be any time after that. Once it's finished... Any time after that, we better be ready. Now, we found in one of the other sessions we talked about, it, we found a seemingly a gap, possibly a gap between the 120th Jubilee and the rapture of the church. Now, what happens at the 120th Jubilee or the end of 120 Jubilees? The earth lease expires and man's dominion is no more on planet earth. The devil tapped into man's authority through wicked men and has ruled planet earth for nearly 6,000 years. Oh, we've been able to hold some of our ground. But when the earth lease expires, man loses his dominion, and wicked men will lose their authority on earth, and the only people on planet earth that will have authority will be those connected with the name of Jesus. And God will take back this planet, and he will have authority on this planet to do what he will on this earth, and he will not be restrained by any lease. See, God is a God of his word. There's people today who say, well, if there was a God, he had changed abortion and stopped killing all the millions of babies every year. No, God can't do it unless man does it, because he gave man authority for 6,000 years. Read it in Genesis 1. Let them have dominion. Now, when God says, let them have dominion, that means they're going to have dominion, and God's not going to come in and take over the thing until the lease expires. Now, he'll do everything he can to work through men to change it. But when this lease expires... Man has lost their dominion, and the only people that will have dominion on earth is those that are under the headship of Jesus Christ and God the Father, and God will take back control of this planet. And there is going to be the most traumatic change that had ever happened in 6,000 years of human history, and the ACLU is going to be in trouble big time. And a lot of other folks. 
So you can see the prophetic profile that God has laid out here in the scriptures that they're celebrating. Now, see, I was raised in a full gospel church, and a few years ago they had a homecoming. And what they did, they had every pastor that was still alive that pastored that church to come and preach. And they called it a homecoming. Well, here you have 120 priests doing the same thing they would do on a jubilee, blowing the trumpet. And obviously, this is a homecoming. Now, look at this. It said, it came to pass that as the trumpeters and the singers were as one and made one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, that when they lifted up their voices with the trumpet, the cymbals, the instruments of music, and praising the Lord, saying, For he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. The glory of the Lord had filled the house of God at the 120th Jubilee or the end of the 120th Jubilee, there's two or three ways you could take that. Now, when I wrote the book, End Time Events, I was convinced that this was possibly the rapture of the church and that this was the church showing up in the house of the Lord. But as I've studied this gap theory that we talked about, that space of time, is it possible that here he is talking about the house of the Lord here on earth once the lease expires, that the glory of the Lord is going to fall upon the church in a fashion that has not happened in all of 6,000 years of human history. Because when the wicked lose their authority to hinder the gospel and pollute the harvest, it is phenomenal what can happen in six months' time if God's anointing is turned up sevenfold, like we found in Isaiah Chapter 30, verse 26, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. Well, in the fourth day of the Genesis account, the sun shined through, the greater light ruled the day. That obviously represents when Jesus came to the earth. It was the sun, the natural sun, but it represents the sun of righteousness. And the moon that ruled the night represents Christians that reflect the light of the sun of righteousness to a sin-darkened world. And if the light of the moon becomes as the light of the sun, then we begin to minister as Jesus ministered with the same anointing. And I believe this is a prophetic profile that could indicate that that is what's going to happen when the earth lease expires. There may be a space of time that God will open the windows of heaven and the church would be under an open heaven. We see that. We've all read it and quoted it concerning tithing in Malachi 3. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And certainly that's true. And it proved me now here with that I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And he says, now if you strike out all of the, the italics in that verse, here's what it says. I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. In other words, you'll be un under an open heaven of blessing. And that not enough. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, when God rebukes the devourer, he is rebuked. When is he going to be rebuked? When the lease expires, God is going to rebuke the devourer. And according to the parable of the tares, they will be bound in bundles to burn them, not and burn them, and then gather the harvest. And that's what's about to happen. We are coming to the greatest harvest this earth has ever known, and it's the greatest anointing that the church has ever experienced in all of 6,000 years of human history is about to explode on planet earth. It's going to be a spiritual atomic explosion, <laughs> atomic spiritual explosion or something. God is going to turn this world right side up. The scripture says... He will turn the wicked upside down. Now, isn't that interesting? The number 666 is what the Antichrist will use. Turn it upside down. What is it? 999. My wrath. That's the grammatra, the numerical value of the Hebrew word for my wrath. 999. 
so he'll turn 666 to 999. <laughs> Blessed be God. I don't know about you, but I'm so excited I can't hardly preach this. Hallelujah. Well, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So evidently, this is representing the 120th Jubilee. Now, remember the Solomon concept, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. Who built the house of the Lord here that we're reading about? Solomon. And he's the one that said, the thing that has been is that which shall be, and the thing that is done is that which shall be done, and there's no new thing under the sun. What we're seeing in this Evidently, the earth lease will expire after 120 jubilees or 6,000 years, and then we're going to see the most dramatic change on earth that the earth has ever seen, and the world does not have a clue as to what is about to happen. 